Coming up on DTNS, did Google and Facebook team up to fix ad prices? TikTok and Walmart are going to team up to live stream shopping. And Los Angeles Electric Veal Co Company deals with its ties to the Chinese Communist Party. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, December 17th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about uh, the follies of setting a routine for your smart home lights, uh, as well as haircuts and chocolate colas. Get that wider conversation, become a member, and get good day internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Facebook ran another ad campaign Thursday in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post against Apple, asking consumers if they would pay for apps that are currently free, suggesting that content makers will have to turn to subscriptions to replace lost ad revenue. You might recall that on Wednesday, Facebook also outlined its arguments in full-page ads against Apple's privacy change, which it claims, quote, threatens the pers personalized ads that millions of small businesses rely on to find and reach consumers. Coinbase announced Thursday it confidentially filed for an IPO. Coinbase did not announce how it would structure the IPO, although co-founder Fred Ursum uh, previously told Fortune that the company is spiritually, quote, unquote, spiritually built to go public via an offering involving digital tokens on a blockchain, which I imagine the US SEC would have something to say about. So don't expect that, but at least, you know, fun to think about. Security researchers at Ben Gurion University published a paper demonstrating how a computer's RAM could be turned into a weak Wi-Fi signal to exfiltrate data from an air-gapped system. The paper showed that perfectly timed read-write operations to a computer's RAM can make the memory bus emit electromagnetic waves consistent with a weak Wi-Fi signal. The researchers were able to leak data from an air-gapped system to machines several meters away with rates up to 100 bits per second. Unlike exploits published by Ben Gurion, researchers in the past, this can be done without obtaining root access. Mm. A judge has ordered Apple CEO Tim Cook and Senior Vice President of Software Engineering Craig Federighi to testify for Apple in the Epic lawsuit. Uh, and they must produce required documents before the next hearing, which Epic has asked for. Apple asked what Tim that our Apple asked that Tim Cook's deposition be limited to four hours and also requested Eric Neuenschwander, who runs the App Store, be present instead of Federighi. The judge denied both requests. Next deadline for court filings is January 6th. That's also the day they count the Electoral College votes, 2021. Oh, this is going to be a long one, isn't it? Yeah, Qual yeah, it is. <laughs> Qualcomm announced that it's working with Google to provide support its, for its chipsets for three years of major OS updates and four years of security updates, starting with the flagship Snapdragon 888 system on a chip. The support will extend to even low-end chipsets as well. These updates will be provided to OEMs who will need to update their Android skins and ship working builds of each of their devices for consumers to receive the updates. Google also announced that Android 11 has seen the fastest adoption rate ever, slightly outperforming Android 10 at the same point in its release life. All right, let's talk a little more about Google's acquisition of Fitbit. Where are we at, Justin? I'll tell you, Tom, the European Commission provisionally uh, approved Google's $2.1 billion acquisition of Fitbit. Google committed for the next 10 years not to use European Fitbit users' health data for advertising and must maintain technical separation of Fitbit's data from Google's. Google also committed to let users link competing apps to Fitbit data and also competing wearable device makers' access to Android functions. The acquisition was originally announced on November 1st, 2019, how young we were, and is still <laughs> under review in Australia and the United States of America. Yes, so uh, a short 13 months later, uh, we finally get approval in, in Europe. Uh, we're not done yet. I mean, we uh, were busy. We were busy. We had a lot on our plate. <laughs> Fair. Right? Like, Fair. Google Fitbit, let's shelve that just for a minute. I like the idea of competing apps being able to use Fitbit data. I have a lot of Fitbit data that kind of has to stay within Fitbit itself uh, using my watch and, and my Fitbit app. So that could be cool. 
you know, we're going to get into this a little bit more with some of the other major companies for which now we have a decade plus worth of data invested in, but specifically in a product that is about the quantifiable self. You want as much data that you are collecting if you are wearing a Fitbit and have been a loyal Fitbit customer. You want to be able to plug that into whatever services come next. That is in incredibly valuable. I would hope that we protect some of this, uh, our, our own rights to our own data and not to be locked away from it when the approvals come from the other countries. The other question that I have is, considering some of the other topics we're going to go over on this uh, show, is this a prequel for the next antitrust suit that we will see <laughs> against Google 10 years from now? Are you saying it's a trap? Uh, that they're just saying uh, it's a long con. Ten years later, we'll be unwinding this acquisition. Well, in, in, in all seriousness, I do think that part of what we're seeing is that the the approvals on these processes were done in a world where the regulators didn't quite know exactly how fast and how important these companies would be and this data would be specifically. Uh, the real puzzler now is when a merger like this is approved, are we further uh, further along on the understanding curve from these governments to say, well, no, maybe we shouldn't allow this to go just because we're afraid of where it might go from here. Right. And so far, the, the EU has said no. They're, they're addressing the concerns that people have of letting Fitbit be bought by Google. But yeah. what are the concerns that they don't know they are going to have in the future is the question. Or are there any? Uh, and 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 that's where I don't love these one one off things where it's like, well, if you don't want health data to be used for advertising, I don't know, Europe, maybe have a law about that instead of doing a yeah. one off thing. I, if you want people to have data portability, uh, maybe uh, encourage data portability uh, instead of doing a one off. That, that would be my only objection here. I, I don't object in principle to these ideas. TikTok is partnering with Walmart to test live streamed shopping within TikTok's app. This is a big deal. It's huge in, in, in Asia and in China and Southeast Asia. A lot of companies doing it here in the United States as well. Amazon, uh, for instance, already does this. Uh, but TikTok wants to get in on the game. They've already taken some steps into allowing shopping on their platform, but this would be the first live stream shopping. So on December 18th, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, Walmart will host a holiday shop along spectacular. Uh, viewers will be able to shop from Walmart's fashion catalog within Walmart's TikTok profile. The fashion items for purchase will also be featured in content from 10 popular TikTok creators, including Michael Lee, Devon Anderson, Taylor Hagers, and Zara Hashimi. As products are shown on screen, a little pin will appear that you can tap on and add that item to a cart, or all the items are going to show up in an, a big uh, event cart that you can tap on eventually and see everything that was in the stream. And that'll stick around for a while. So you can, you can shop even after the live stream is over. Uh, Walmart says there's no rev share on this cause it's a test. Uh, TikTok just wants to see how it goes. Uh, not only is this something that has a worldwide adoption rate that is greater than ours, you're kind of waiting for whatever the American thing that helps this latent desire sort of break through, at least if you're TikTok or Walmart, but it really is yet another example of how not only is the transaction important in our modern digital ecosystem, but the method of the transaction is really important. And and when you've watched companies like Rakuten or something like that, that, that are effectively based off the idea of kickbacks from these sites uh, that, that they are doing a rev share with or, or, or front loading, uh, this idea of live stream purchasing is, likely going to succeed. I think Walmart's a smart partner. TikTok, obviously, now that they seem to be outside of uh, uh, the, the the spectrum of being booted off American soil, seems I mean, like- I knows, right? Yeah, it seems like it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's also, you know, it's the creators. I'm not familiar, as far as I know, with, with any of the creators that are the the uh, the partners off the, off the top. Yeah, the influencers. I'm not gonna go to Walmart's TikTok profile, probably, uh, unless it shows up in it for you, and then, you know, it's my own fault, but- if if somebody says you know that something that's offered at Walmart, you know, think like Walmart. Well, okay, there's not going to be, I don't know, like Gucci clothes there, or you know, makeup that's like a million dollars. It's it's sort of the everyday stuff. If I've got uh, somebody that I like on the platform already, who's like, I really like this, and you should get it, and here's why. That kind of stuff. I mean, it's gonna sell like hotcakes. 
Oh, yeah. And, and do your point with like the makeup. Yeah, it might not be the fancy makeup, but if some influencer that you like is walking by the, the Walmart makeup counter and saying, oh, you want to know what? This is exactly like this Fenty thing that you're going to spend $5,000 more right. on. Then you're like, OK, well, maybe I'll give this Walmart thing a shot. Exactly. Well, back in October, Twitter announced a temporary change that any retweet would be a quote tweet, meaning you see the original tweet and then you add a little something to it rather than just retweeting it. Twitter announced that it will no longer prompt users to quote retweet content by default, though. Twitter initially changed the default in the hopes that it would lead to more thoughtful amplification. While quote tweet volume increased after the change, Twitter also found that 45% of them included single word affirmations and 70% had less than 25 characters. The increase in quote tweets was also offset by an overall 20% decrease in sharing through both retweets and quote tweets. That came from Twitter itself. And another end to a temporary change, Facebook has restored its news feed algorithm to show how it worked prior to the U.S. election. Shortly after Election Day, Facebook had tweaked the algorithm to favor mainstream outlets in its NEQ, that stands for News Ecosystem Quality. A Facebook spokesperson told The Verge, quote, This was a temporary change we made to help limit the spread of inaccurate claims about the election, and we're still ensuring that people see authoritative and informative news on Facebook. Uh, so a, a couple different things going on here, I think. Uh, in, in, in the 10,000-foot view... It's two social networks who had a policy in place for the election now reverting that policy. And you can decide whether you think it's a good idea to have special policies for something like this or not. That's one thing. But the other thing I note is that Twitter said, hey, we tried a thing. It didn't work. So we're reverting mm -hmm. that thing and we probably won't try that thing again. Uh, you could blame them for, you know, you can say like, I knew it would never work, but I, I don't blame them for saying, look, we, we tried it. We thought it might work. We looked at the, we did a test. It seemed like it would work, but in reality, it didn't. Great. Now we've learned. Whereas Facebook is saying, hey, we tried this thing and everybody, actually our own staff want us to keep it, but too bad. We're getting rid of it because that's what we're doing. And I, I didn't see a whole lot more explanation about whether it worked, whether it didn't, and why they are reverting it. Well, I mean, if, if we are going to take the political side of this, then then the, the the conversation is, all right, well, Twitter took active means and Facebook took active means to suppress certain information uh, uh, in, in the run-up to the election. Uh, uh, they have now decided that that specific topic is something that you are allowed to cover, uh, and that specifically is investigations into Hunter Biden. But these both were there to site-wide tamp down certain uh, uh, modes of speech, either by what you're going to see or by, in Twitter's possibly misguided idea, uh, uh, that you would think more about what you would retweet if you were forced to think about what you would write on top of it. All that being said, and, and look, there's a lot of conversation to be had here politically. What I think is fascinating is what we expect from these companies. Do we expect them to be the scrappy Silicon Valley, move fast and break things, let's change it, don't worry, we can always change it back. We don't really have a whole lot of, we're not beholden to our audience to explain exactly what we're doing or explain it in advance or leave it there for a certain amount of time because we want to optimize and min-maxing means a lot of changes. Or have they matured to a point and possibly have enough heat on them from the federal government to say, no, we're we're going to announce what we're doing for the election in June, and we're going to stick to that. We're putting that boat in the water, and, and if it sinks during it, then we'll address it afterward. But we want to remain an even-handed thing, and, and, and sometimes we do have to flip the switch to DEFCON 1, but you're going to know what that means. We're going to be transparent about it, and then when it's done, we're going to flip it back at a certain date. And right now, it seems like they are far more like the companies that they started as than institutions in the way that I think colloquially they're looked at as. Yeah, the Facebook one in particular just seems like it was reacting to public pressure. Like people wanted a nicer news feed. So we made a nicer news feed, but now we don't need to do that anymore. So we want to go back to the one that makes us more money. That's kind of the way I read that. 
the Twitter one, they did a, a small test and saw an effect. They said, yeah, retweeting of, of certain kinds of information did slow down. And mm -hmm. slowing down passing along of information, I think, is much more palatable because you're not telling people what information they can pass along. WhatsApp does this where it limits how many people you can forward things to. It's, it doesn't matter what it is. It's all treated the same. Where And, and so... This is a, a situation where the small sample size of their test looked like it would work. The large sample size of doing it in, in public didn't work. And that well, yeah. still is the, the min-maxing original, you know, Silicon Valley way of doing it. Uh, but I'm, I'm much more comfortable with that than Facebook just saying, like, we decided what news you wanted to hear during the election. And now we're going to go back because either it means they decided you shouldn't hear some stuff or it means uh, there was bad stuff and now we're going to let you hear the bad stuff again. Like, can't have it both ways. Yeah, the whole quote tweet thing, which I use all the time because I often think that if I blindly retweet something, well, I'm not blindly retweeting it, but if I don't have anything on top of it to say, people kind of go, eh, you know, it's whatever. But if you say like, hey, this is a really interesting article, you should read it. And then you see the original tweet quoted below, that makes a lot of sense. I'm sure what Twitter found was in trying to get people to stop blind retweeting without having thoughtful commentary about it and saying, this is why this is important to me, which makes the conversation richer in theory, you probably got a lot of people saying like, I don't know, putting a period, right? And just not saying anything so that they quote tweet, even though you could still you could still retweet the other way, but having it as a default probably just got a lot of engagement that wasn't what Twitter was looking for. Yeah, they saw a 20% decrease in sharing, which if the point is to slow things down, then it slowed things down. Hey, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is our subreddit. Uh, you can submit stories there and vote on them. Both of those things help us quite a bit. Go over and check it out, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, let's take a closer look at the antitrust suits filed against Google. A uh, new one filed Thursday, 35 states as well as Guam, Puerto Rico, and D.C., led by Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser and Nebraska Attorney General Doug Peterson, both those people from different parties, uh, have brought the suit against Google that accuses it of anti-competitive behavior, including designing its search engine to favor its own products above competitors. So this is something Yelp is often used as the example of someone who complains about this. You put your own Google reviews above Yelp reviews in your own search results. The suit asks the court to restore a competitive marketplace and, quote, counter any advantages that Google gained as a result of its anti-competitive conduct, uh, including possible divestitures. Uh, so it says you might even need to break part of Google out to fix this. The suit claims Google limits ads in some categories that compete with Google and extracts customer data from the advertisers it does allow on the platform and then uses that data to compete against them. That's similar to the accusations brought against Amazon, where they, they use the data from people who sell on their platform to compete with them. Now, this suit is separate from the one we mentioned briefly yesterday. Uh, Texas's state attorney general has taken issue with requirements for ad publishers. And we know a little more about that suit than we did because uh, it was breaking right as we were getting ready to record yesterday. This one alleges that Google and Facebook had a secret agreement that manipulated ad auctions to benefit both companies. Google and Facebook did publicly partner to let advertisers in Facebook's audience network bid on ads in Google's network in September 2018. Uh, this is not unusual. There's a lot of ad companies out there that interoperate this way. The secret part was that Facebook allegedly agreed not to support a competing software that was using something called header bidding at the time, uh, which would have brought more competition to Google in advertising placement. Now, that's the allegation, is that they, they dropped their support of header bidding in order to get special treatment from Google. Facebook allegedly received access to Google data, some policy exceptions, and was given a quota, allegedly, that let its participants win auctions even if they didn't have the highest bid, which of course, if true, would be price fixing and a restraint of trade. If you can prove that that happened, that's an easier antitrust accusation to carry because that's a violation of section one of the Sherman Act which only needs to prove that you restrained trade. 
Section two is the one you usually hear about where you have to show consumer harm. And showing consumer harm is a higher burden of proof. Anyway, Google says Facebook is one of 25 companies in its open bidding program and does not receive special treatment. Uh, and interestingly, Facebook is not accused of any wrongdoing in this complaint. But it could be subject to a separate suit on these same points in a different time. The Texas lawsuit also alleges Google had access to WhatsApp messages. This one seems like a misunderstanding. It likely refers to an agreement that lets users back up their messages to Google Drive because WhatsApp messages are end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and so it's saying all these things about Google had access to messages and they stored them on their own servers. And, and yeah, they do. You can, you can back up your WhatsApp messages to Google Drive. They're still end-to-end -end encrypted. So Google can't tell what's in them. Uh, and don't forget the Department of Justice filed an antitrust suit against Google in October. That one is about search engine exclusivity contracts on browsers and Android. So... Where we want to start. Oh, and I've been waiting for somebody in our antitrust fall season to finally go after what I believe is the, the heart of both Facebook, Amazon, and Google's uh, possible. If they're going to get hit on anything, in my opinion, it's going to be their ad market because they are such dominant players in it. While I do agree with you that if you are able to prove what happens in this price-fixing lawsuit, that is more of a slam dunk, although I don't know exactly what the lasting damage might be to either Google or Facebook beyond paying a fine and, and maybe you know uh, doing some kind of restitution. I don't know what a permanent change would be. The lawsuit that was filed today with the 35 states, including Guam, Puerto Rico, and D.C., I think is also very interesting because— if you are saying that the the prioritization of these in-house products and then taking the data for when these other, what, what they're called a vertical searches, so just for restaurants like Yelp does or just for kayak, like uh, uh, for, or just for uh, air travel like kayak does. And, and they have said, and it's in this lawsuit, that they've watched their traffic fall that that to me is a fairly provable harm to consumer if part of what you consider the consumer are people that buy ads on on Kayak and Yelp and and you are you are killing a, a very realistically competition that for that ad dollar uh, uh I don't know I, I think both of these uh, compared to everything else that we've seen to Facebook and Google uh, uh, thus far these are the most compelling to me because of what they go after and the fact that if Google is going to have made a, you know, a, a mistake or stepped over the line, it's going to be in protection of their golden goose that is laying the golden eggs, and that is AdWords. Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be harder to prove consumer harm. Uh, you would have to get a court to define the advertisers as the consumer. I'm not sure you can get a court to do that. Uh, and if you can't, then you have to show that this drove up prices in an ancillary way because these businesses uh, couldn't compete as much. And that becomes really nebulous. Uh, but it does seem like the more orderly and straightforward of the two suits. The Texas suit is a little bit all over the place, has some outlandish and exaggerated claims, uh, maybe they're not exaggerated. I don't know. A lot of it's redacted, so it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and and we'll see, because that's the one that's, uh, it's got the lowest probability of being true, but the, uh, the highest probability of being sensational, if it is true. And also, it it, it feels like uh, uh, something that might just be a deal that Facebook or or Google didn't particularly think was controversial, and now in the cold light of this level of scrutiny, might feel like something that was over the line. Well, so. Google's saying they don't get the special treatment, so they're outright denying it in public yeah. anyway. Yeah. LA-based electric vehicle company Canoe will debut on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange at the end of the week and has announced its second vehicle, another van. That's not what it's called, but it's, it, it is another van. The first van was a subscription-only passenger van that included registration, maintenance, insurance management, and charging, and is set to launch next year. This new announcement is for purchase and meant for last-mile deliveries. Starts at $33,000 for 230 cubic feet of cargo space and three different battery pack options. There is no price for the second model that has 500 cubic feet of carbo, uh, cargo space with options for things like storage lockers, ramps, and a roll-up door. So... New electric uh, uh, vehicle company, that's interesting on its own, especially for a show like this that tells you about such things. 
Some folks may be, uh, be just interested if not for this corporate shakeup, however. Tony Achilla invested three, or sorry, uh, $35 million in Canoe this summer and was recently elevated to chairman. The Verge says he compares himself to Elon Musk, who came in and took over Tesla and made it what it is today. Akilia was the founder of risk management and asset protection software company Solera Holdings and is an Army veteran. And Akilia is making some changes. He has removed CEO Ulrich Kranz, a former BMW executive, from the board of directors. And it's unclear if he'll stay on as CEO. Akilia told The Verge that he needs different experience than what Kranz has. And as one of Canoe's founding investors, Pak Tam Lee, has been removed from the board, Lee is the son-in-law of Ji Quin Lin, who is the fourth most senior leader in China before retiring in 2013. My goodness. Yeah. 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 So if you didn't catch that, the fourth most senior leader in China is definitely a member of the Chinese Communist Party. And if you got someone who is even related by marriage to a member of the Chinese Communist Party on your board, you're going to get interest from the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. They want to avoid that, so they took him off the board. He still owns like 32 36% of Canoe, though, so that's that's just a fact. Uh, Tony Akila try, really trying to paint himself as being the guy who's going to make Canoe into the next Tesla here. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he makes himself CEO and he just doesn't want to do that until the IPO happens at the end of next week. Uh, so all, all kinds of crazy stuff uh, happening, you know, in, in the in the corporate board there, but also a very interesting uh, electric vehicle company that, yeah. that has yet to ship a product, but is targeting the more businessy end of this industry. Yeah. I mean, if you're a smaller business and there's some delivery that has to happen getting a van, uh, and they sound great, starting at, you know, 33 grand for quite a bit of cargo space and all battery powered. I, I, I would love to see the adoption rate on this, but it, I can think of certainly restaurants and, and, and other retail stores that have been hit particularly hard this, per, this particular year to be able to make sense of canoe and what the business model is. Yeah, so many people love those Mercedes vans. These look very similar mm. uh, to that. And the whole thing with Canoe is they're modular, so they can use their electric vehicle system with lots of different body models and stuff like that. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably see more from them as well. Well, a company called Capella Space. Have you heard of them? If not, launched a satellite several months ago, which is capable of taking clear radar images of anywhere in the world, night or day, rain or shine, and even through the walls of some buildings. Yikes. Yeah, before you freak out, <laughs> it's actually pretty cool technology. On Wednesday, Capella launched a platform letting governmental or private customers request images of anything in the world with six additional satellites set to launch next year. CEO Payam Banadze, a former uh, system engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, tells Futurism, quote, there's a bunch of gaps in how we're currently observing Earth from space. The majority of the sensors that we use to observe Earth are optical imaging sensors. Capella can see through cloud cover, and because it uses synthetic aperture radar, also SAR, SAR, works similarly to how dolphins or bats navigate using echolocation. The satellite uses a 9.65 gigahertz radio signal towards the target and then collects and interprets the signal as it bounces back up into orbit. That is but it also can see through walls. You said something some, about see-through walls? Some walls, some walls. Well, okay, so I was like, before you freak out, I mean, people are like, oh, no, I'm still freaking out about this. Yeah, it depends on who who is buying the technology. You know, you hear like governmental organization. Hmm, what's going on here? Are they going to look at me in my bathroom or whatever? But uh, just the fact that the company is saying, listen, for the longest time, a satellite up in the air, if it was, yeah, there's a bunch of cloud cover because you're up, you're way above the clouds or it's nighttime, Sure, there are certain imagery that you could get, but not the same kind that you could get on a clear, sunny day. Yeah. And the, our technology is is circumventing that, and we can do better, and that's what satellites should go for doing. Yeah. Um, you know, right now it's uh, limited by the resolution of, of synthetic aperture radar. Uh, someday they'll improve that resolution. They'll be able to see right inside your buildings. <laughs> Hey, let's check I mean, out the mailbag. Go ahead and look. I don't have anything to uh, hide. You uh, know, come on. No, you may not. 
Yeah. Right. I know. I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, if you don't have anything to hide, Tom, why do you care? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, what I'm, are you gonna go, I'm doing some dirt in here. No, I'm hiding things. <laughs> uh, in the mailbag, Jeremy wrote in, uh, in in response to our conversation about Facebook and taking out ads against Apple. This is actually Facebook taking ads against Apple yesterday. They've since done it again. Jeremy says, listening to the conversations about Facebook taking out full page ads against Apple and ATT, which is Apple's new uh, nomenclature for the privacy settings, made me wonder. Apple pushed back ATT because companies said that they needed time to integrate it, including Facebook. Should Apple come back and tell the small businesses that Facebook is helping, that ATT is going live in the next iOS update? And if there are any concerns with implementing it, those small businesses should thank Facebook since it clearly lied about what it, what it didn't want. Apple pointing out that Facebook is the bad guy and potentially hurting the people it claims it wants to help would be funny to me. Just a thought. Uh, sure, Jeremy. If that makes you feel better, uh, laugh laugh away. I'm I'm pretty sure they that wouldn't really help the situation any. But all right. <laughs> if you have feedback for us, maybe you have ideas like Jeremy. I don't know. I mean, reach for the stars, people. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Bjorn Andre, Scott Hepburn, and Dale Mulcahy. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, what's new? Look, over the next two weeks, you're either going to be bored or you're traveling. Either way, you can do, yourself, uh, do for yourself an audio book. And uh, that's what you can get with my history series, Raise the Dead. Both season one and season two are now available on Audible. Both contain bonus content. And season two, which covers the 1964 election, contains an hour-long conversation with your daily tech news show host, Tom Merritt. Mm, me. Uh, uh, so go ahead and get it right now. Use your Audible credits at uh, raisethedeadpodcast.com slash complete. Hey, folks, if you can afford $2 a month, uh, you don't have to listen to ads and you get a bunch of extra stuff. Go support us on Patreon, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Do it right now. Don't put it off. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. We'd love to have you if you've got the time. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>